We're recording? We're good? Yeah. Okay, I'll start then. Um, well, I guess that's what we got. So, my name is Mark Lennigan. My call sign, as you can see up there, is uh, KM8FDM or in ICU Kinetics, Kilo, Mike 8, Hotstrot, Open Mic. And I'll be speaking today on how to hack your way into the APRS network on the Qi. So, with no further ado, we'll get going here. Uh, I just want to point out from the beginning that um, if you're like a hardcore APRS using guy, an ham radio operator that, that's w really into APRS, this might not be the talk for you. I'm aiming at uh, introducing people who might not be familiar with the network to what you can do with it. So we're going to be pretty general in the uh, applications and uh, not get like way down deep low level into how the protocol works. Um, I might mention AX.25 for like, Linux and things like that. Uh, but, you know, we're not, we're not going to dig down into, like, driver level stuff. And um, it's not exhaustive. There's an ever-growing number of uh, websites and projects, particularly in the open source community, that uh, are working with APRS, which um, we'll get to what the acronym means in a moment. And um, even as I was doing research in the last week, I was seeing new projects. But then again, a lot of them were like that old uh, XKCD from, I think, last year or so, where um, the stick figure is just grasping his monitor furiously and saying, you know, user number 312, what did you see? What did you know? Because it's like, you'll see this, you'll, you'll go out and look for any, you know, a project maybe using Beelbone on APRS, and the comp, they'll be, it'll be from 2011, and the comment from 2012 is, is this still going on? Is this still a thing? You know? And then there'll be one from 2014, and it's the same sort of thing. So I kind of don't think that project is actually going anywhere. Um, but, so, we'll talk briefly about amateur radio licensing. There are three levels of amateur radio licenses in the U.S., and actually pretty much worldwide. Different countries use different names. Here we call them, look, the first level is technician, the mid-level is general, which gives you access, more access to the high-frequency bands that go worldwide, and the highest level is extra. But you only need a technician license to use APRS, because it's mainly on the, the uh, two-meter band. And the tech exam is easy. If you don't have your license, you can get it. Trust me. Kids as young as six, probably like, you know, um, ghost nomad kids, can have passed this exam. Well, I don't know if they have, but I'm sure they could. And the, the exam is 35 multiple choice questions from a pool of 350 questions. And all of the questions and answers are published on the web. They don't change. Well, they change maybe every five years. But, you know, you can know what they are. Uh, if you go to www.kb6nu.com, uh, he's a ham in Ann Arbor named Dan Romanchek, and he's written a couple of free study guides, one for technician and one for general. If you want his uh, study guide for the, for the extra, I think it costs you like $7.99. Uh, but you can download the first two free, and um, highly recommended for studying, because he gives you all of the, he only talks about the right answers. So kind of trains your brain that when you're looking at the question, you associate the question with the right answer. Um, and for practice, there's several websites you can go to, www.aa9pw, these are all amateur radio call signs, by the way, .com, um, well, www.arl.org is the Amateur Radio Relay League of North America, and uh, QRZ slash ham test is, QRZ means um, what's your call sign in uh, the old Morse code, three-letter code system. And they have a, a ham test there. So, and also, when you go to when you go to your volunteer examiner session, they call it a VE session for the exam. You'll be paying fifteen dollars. The testers don't get any of that money. That all goes to the government. Um, apparently, it costs that much to like you know give you a card in the mail. But and also, I'd like to point out that um, we're running a simplex net here at Nauticon on this frequency four four six dot one hundred with a hundred hertz uh, tone on it. So, if you didn't know that before, you do now. We've been talking around on it. But uh, now we'll get back to uh, packet radio. Um, about the first major use of packet radio was a research project from the University of Hawaii called Aloha Net. Uh, and they were basically trying to link all of the Hawaiian islands, the different campuses of the University of Hawaii, with a packet radio net. And back in about 1970, it was rocking along at 9600 baud on the uh, UHF band, which that runs from 300 megahertz up to 3 gigahertz. And it was a, a duplex network, so all of the remote campuses would transmit in on uh, their own particular frequency, and 
then the main campus would transmit out on one frequency. If there was a collision, the main campus, which means like two different um, remote campuses were trying to transmit at the same time, the main campus would back off for an arbitrary number of microseconds or seconds and then retransmit. And this project led to uh, advances such as carrier sent multiple access, collision detection, which is the basis of Ethernet. And some of these protocols are still used today in GSM cell phones. Um, the other uh, advance is, of course, ARPANET, which was the proponent of the internet and uh, famously started as a sketch on a cocktail napkin, which means at its very inception, the internet was based on alcohol. Um, and I personally found this very interesting in my research. SRI Incorporated in, uh, out in California, um, they built a packet radio van, which was, they bought a bread truck. Um, and if you don't know what these, I'm going to show the picture later, but if you don't want to know what these are, it's like what the guys in the movie Sneakers were driving around. Um, and then they fitted it out and back with UHF radios and a PDP-11. And then, of course, a lot of air conditioning because all of that puts out a lot of heat. Uh, and on November 22nd, 1977, they made the first transmissions on a packet net from this van. And of course, because it's, you know, the 70s and it's the internet and it's California, they decided to go to a biker bar and sit at the picnic table and transmit their uh, packets back and forth from there. So the internet was weird from the beginning. Here's the van. Um, it also reminds me of the NinjaTel van from DEF CON 20. You can kind of see the the UHF antenna up there and the uh, air conditioning unit. And it's currently an exhibit at the Computer History Museum, which I think is out in, uh, like, where? Mountain View? Okay, I was going to say San Francisco, but um, we'll go with Mountain View. And then there was also AmperNet, which is Amateur Packet Radio Net. This was active starting in the late 70s, uh, very active in the 80s, and kind of started to taper off towards the mid-90s. But as a result of it, Amateur radio operators have access to an entire Class A address block on the internet in IPv4 space, which these days is like gold. Um, so the network is defunct, but there's several routers at like University of California, California San Diego that still route between the 44 dot and the rest of the internet. So if you want to start putting stuff on, you know, packet nets and point towards that IP address, you could do that. It'd be kind of slow, but, you know, you've got a whole class A. Go nuts. And now we'll get to what um, APRS currently means. It's Amateur Packet Reporting System. Uh, in its inception, it was Amateur Position Reporting System, but as the network has grown and evolved, it started being used for a lot more things. And the name is derived from Bob Bruninga's call sign WB4APR, uh, which, I, which is, I believe he just got randomly assigned to him. Um, and he's the, he is the mad scientist who invented all of this. Um, he works for the Navy. And, um, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So yeah, he, according to his website, uh, APRS is a two-way tactical real-time digital network sharing information about, the event, about events in the local area. Uh, it was initially developed in the late 1980s. There were actually a couple of forerunner networks that he worked on, but I couldn't find any, um, like verifiable sources about what these were. It was all like Wikipedia and a bunch of citation needed stuff. So I kind of left that out. But it, the basic signaling of the network is Bell 202 uh, analog frequency shift being at 1200 baud. Occasionally people will go with a 9600 baud and that's kind of more and more frequent. Um, and it's FM, mod it's frequency modulation. Um, so Basically, we're using the same sort of technology that modems used in the late 80s. Uh, and I like to say we're partying like it's 1989. Um, and what's neat about the network is it can operate standalone, meaning just on the RF side. But if the internet is up and we don't have something like the blackout of 2003 or, you know, the zombie apocalypse everyone seems to be worried about, um, all the packets that are sent on the RF side of the network eventually find their way to the internet and vice versa. Um, in most implementations, it's a simplex digital network, and simplex just means everyone's on the same frequency. So you're transmitting and receiving on the same frequency. For the network administrators in the audience or network hackers, it's a connectionless broadcast network. Most of the time, people aren't listening to see if there's a transmission already 
occurring on that frequency. They're just transmitting a packet. And, you know, if it gets received, great. If not, well, I guess you have to transmit again or, you know, harder. Um, but there's several different devices on the network, and we'll start to see what these are a little bit later in the talk. There's trackers, which track the positions of objects, like a vehicle. There's digipeters, which receive the packet, and then will, you know, they're like a repeater on a network, a hub. They'll transmit it, you know, with more power, greater range, that sort of thing. There are I gates, which is a gate to the internet, and if the I gate is actually configured properly, it should be a bidirectional I gate. It's so that packet, if it receives a packet, it is transferring that packet to the internet. And likewise, if someone, say, in Mountain View, California, sends a text message to us here at Nauticon, and it hits an I gate in Mountain View and travels over the internet, it should pop out of an I gate in Cleveland and essentially sort of find the, the person that is, it's addressed to. Um, unfortunately, a lot of I gates are not configured that way. There's also weather stations, which are legion on the APRS. And uh, mostly these are, are run by amateur radio operators, but because they're connected to the APRS network, they go to the internet, and NOAA actually gets a lot of its local um, data in the field from these volunteer amateurs who are running a weather station at their house or their summer place or their boat or whatever. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the, the frequencies. Um, typically, APRS is in, used in VHF on 2 meters, which is the 144 megahertz band. In the US, the allocation goes up to 148 megahertz, which sounds like it's kind of small, but when you're, when you're only using, you know, 25 kilohertz, 12.5 kilohertz, there's a lot of space there. Uh, this, by convention in the U.S., the, the frequency is 144.390 megahertz in North America. It's 144.800 in Europe, and other countries around the world use different frequencies. Um, it was just too many to list. And in really high use areas like maybe the west coast of the U.S. or New York City or um, Chicago, sometimes you'll see activity, APRS packets being transmitted on UHF bands like the 70 centimeter 440 megahertz band or the 33 centimeter 900 megahertz band. That's starting to come, become more common. And um, there's occasionally packets transmitted on these high frequency bands that can go across half of the world or more. Uh, usually, from what I was reading, this is a lot of people who like own a boat and they're cruising around the world, like you know the South Pacific or whatever, where there's really not a lot of repeaters. So there are pre there are specific frequencies on 10 meters and 30 meters that they can beacon out a packet and relay their position, which I suppose in their case would be good because you know if something happens, you've got a you've got a track in the middle of the ocean to start from, unlike say you know MH370. Um, but uh, there's other systems that I found. One was called Enhanced Position Location Reporting System. It's used by the U.S. military and was developed by the Navy in the 1980s. Um, I noticed that Bob Reninga was working for the Navy at that time. And like APRS, EPRLRS is a real-time tactical information reporting network. Um, if you wanted to get an idea of what the, of what the, I couldn't find it uh, or a good image on the net. But in the movie The Hunt for October, where they're, where they're looking at the Atlantic Ocean and you see all the blue and red uh, icons for where the different ships and aircraft are or whatever, that's what the military wanted to use EPLRS for, so that they can tell at a glance what their theater of combat or whatever looks like. Um, but unlike APRS, it's a lot more, it's a lot more what they would, what the, I guess the guys would call high speed, low drag. It's using UHF. It can use any any frequency in the UHF, and basically goes where there's. It's, since it's frequency hopping, it's looking for where frequencies that aren't currently in use, aren't currently being jammed, aren't currently noisy, and you know, moving through that that empty space in the band. Um, whereas APRS is stuck on one frequency, and um, currently it's capable of two megabits a second, whereas you know APRS is 1200 baud. I think it's on the quad. Um, but, you know, you can't have everything if, if you're just hacking it yourself. Um, but I did think it was interesting that, you know, a few years after APRS came out, all of a sudden the Navy is using a similar um, 
similar system, and the guy who designed it, designed the amateur protocols, happens to work for the Navy, and it's not really clear what he does for the Navy, other than teach a few classes at Annapolis. So, can't prove it, but I think there's a connection there. Um, now moving on, applications of APRS, position reporting, obviously. Um, it's used a lot, uh, especially more and more these days, in remote telemetry reporting from weather stations, amateur weather balloons. I'm actually working on a project at IC Detroit right now called Project Cradle Cube. We're aiming to break an altitude record with an amateur weather balloon. Um, and we, our launch date's been pushed back to May now, but we do hope to get it uh, launched in the spring. So um, keep monitoring, like, I'll give my contact info at the end, keep monitoring my Twitter stream and things like that. Um, eventually we'll, we'll tell you, like, when you can track our balloon on the websites and so forth. Um, the other things that APRS are used for is uh, there's a system called AIS, which all of the modern uh, boats and ships have that beacon their position. These, it's not, it's not on amateur frequencies, but it also feeds into the same uh, databases and networks on the internet. So uh, when you're tracking APRS objects, you'll frequently see things like, for example, freighters on the Great Lakes, pleasure craft if they happen to have a tracker on them. And they're, um, they're, like, they're requ there are certain requirements that they have. So when you, when you click on their object, it will tell you the, the name of the boat or ship and its length, its beam, its depth, what it's laden with, and its expected ETA in port. Um, and obviously this doesn't work all the time. The, the, there was a, a Russian freighter that was derelict, I think, and then it was being towed for salvage and the tow line broke and it was wandering around the North Atlantic like six months ago. Um, they've lost track of it. So again, it's a big ocean, you know. Maybe it's having a party with MH370, I don't know. Um, but um, the main thing, one of the other things, and I, I use APRS personally for this quite a bit, is notifying other amateurs of what frequency I'm on. So like if I'm driving, I'll put a tag in my APRS tracker that, you know, I'm monitoring like right now, I, I, mine says I'm monitoring 446.100 for Nauticon, so that if somebody's driving by, and they, they can see that, and then they can contact me over the radio. Um, text messaging, which really should be more like cell phone text messaging. If you're writing a novel, there's another service called Winlink that you should use. Um, because at 1200 baud, you're going to be tying up the network for a long time. And if you're like, if your packet is several minutes long, you're probably talking over top of other people. Um, and uh, like, and they, they'll say email, but again, it's supposed to be like a very short email to somebody's email account. Like, hey, I want to get in touch with you. Uh, give me a call or, you know, call me on the ham radio, whatever. Um, and um, then there's also Mike E, which initially I was kind of perplexed at what this is, but it's basically like a, um, if a radio is equipped with Mike E, it will, when you key up your on your voice frequency, it will also chirp out an APRS packet on the APRS frequency to give the position of where you are currently for voice, and that might be useful. Like if you're if you're a bunch of amateurs who are say working a search and rescue mission or something like that. So if, if you don't have to say where you are right now. The GPS connected to your radio is automatically relaying that information back. Um, I've also seen where tornadoes are marked, although that seems a little bit odd because they move at about 70 miles an hour. Um, around Phoenix last year when they had all the bad wildfires, they were marking, the amateurs were out marking the positions of wildfires with um, with APRS, and they actually had a fire icon on APRS.fi, and it looked like Phoenix, the whole, the, the whole city, it looked like it had a ring of fire around it. Um, and like I had said earlier, you know, locations of search and rescue teams, and basically whatever you can think of. That's the great thing about amateur radio. You can hack it to your own heart's content. Um, I'm now going to tempt fate and do a live demo. Um, but first, I, at Shmook, when I was at ShmooCon last year, well, actually this year, um, my call sign, like I said earlier, is KM8FDM, and um, you'll see here the dash seven, that's the SSID that I'm uh, putting into the APRS network. It's indicative that I'm using a, a handheld transceiver, like, like this sort of thing, and you know, not a mobile, or I'm not a vehicle, that sort of thing. 
But as soon as we landed at Baltimore Washington International, I fired up my APRS tracker just in receive mode um, and through the cell network and was really surprised. So, you know, this is my location here. And remember Bob Reninga's call sign, WB APR? That's him. He was driving by the airport right as I landed. I thought that was pretty serendipitous. Um, so I had to, like, screenshot that. But uh, now we're going to go to, I've been talking about what you can see on the net, and we're going to go to um, live what's going on. So this is, um, this is the hotel here, and the uh, X Windows icon is the icon that I'm beaconing. It's basically you just do a, a it's like a slash and uh, one single alphanumeric character in ASCII, and then the uh, the system interprets it as an icon. Uh, so I just picked the X Windows symbol because I like it. X marks the spot. Um, but all of these position points, you can you can click on them. And uh, if I didn't say so before, the website is APRS.fi in Finland. And you click on it, and um, you get the exact information of what the packet is, the date that it was sent, the time, um, you know, my speed, my altitude, and then, like I was saying, the you know, the tag that I can put on there. So this is, you know, as I'm as I'm driving here, and I have no idea what happened here. I think the GPS kind of wigged out because I had never went over there, um, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, so like here, I'm monitor. I'm telling people I'm monitoring 146.520, which is the national calling frequency on two meters. Um, and then if we zoom out, you'll see a lot more other um, traffic around. And um, if those of you driving in noticed a large transmission tower, that's this right here. There's a amateur radio repeater on it, and they give the frequency and the offset. They don't give the tone that you need to open up the squelch, unfortunately, so I can't use it. Um, what? Um, WB8 uh, Tango Hotel Delta dash Bravo. It, do, it it clearly has a tone because if you just if you just uh, transmit. <laughs> Thank you, Rashad. Uh, if you just transmit into it, it, it doesn't it doesn't open up for you. It doesn't come back with its call sign or a uh, courtesy tone or anything. But it's there. Um, it's V star. Well, the the that could be. Um, maybe that's why, because like they're using the D symbol, and that from my experience, that that D in the in the uh, square on its side is not really a diamond. Is I've seen that used for digipeters before. That's what okay. But if it's D star, that explains much about everything. I didn't realize that. Um, when I was talking about weather stations, these WX symbols, those are the weather stations, and um, so you know there you get the the current weather report from the station from the last packet, um, and um, somebody's using a tornado icon over here for their for their car when they're driving. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe. What? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going really fast. Um, and then there's some other stuff around. Um, the FM repeaters are this little tower symbol, and there you'll get the uh, like it's telling the the tone and the offset and things like that. And there's a some place around. Okay, so when I was talking about eye gates, this is an eye gate. This well, actually, this is a digipeter and an eye gate. Um, so that's uh, transmitting and receiving packets to and from the internet, and it tells you, you know, what its power output is, how high its antenna is, what antenna it's using, and a range, which I'm assuming they calculate that, but that's not just like uh, uh, based on a pro like a propagation report every day or whatever. But um, yeah, I I personally have loads of fun just using like when I go someplace because what APRS is really supposed to be for is not like I mean, yeah, you can track your car and find out where your friends are and stuff like that, but the original idea was an amateur who has an APRS-capable radio could go to any part of the country or the world and 
set their radio up on the local APRS frequency and wait about a half hour and then know what's going on amateur radio wise in their local area, like where repeaters are, uh, what services are available, who's around, what, you know, is there uh, a net on a repeater, um, you know, is there a ham swap coming up, that sort of thing. Um, so it, w it was envisioned as more than just, you know, tracking ourselves. Um, but now that Google Latitude isn't really around and also, you know, Google's kind of just spamming everything into the NSA whether they like it or not, um, if you wanted that kind of, you know, here's where I am, APRS is great for that and what's also great about it is if you don't want to be tracked, you just, you can just turn it off. You can just air gap your radio. Um, so, with that, we'll move back and move on and um, go on to hardware. The basics of an APRS setup is an amateur radio, a handheld like this one, or um, there's mobile to be setting up uh, probably an HF rig or all band rig here sooner or later. A GPS unit um, for position and time information and a TNC, that's a terminal node controller or a packet modem, then basically that's for, and uh, actually NND peers, this is a rig blaster. So when we say about, we're talking about a TNC, that's what we're talking about. Um, there's other ones, they're all kind of about that size. How much was that? Okay, but I, I want to say the rig blasters were like, what, $250, $300? Okay. Um, well, some of the older ones, you're, you're paying like, you know, almost as much as a, as a PC for something that is basically allowing you to do a radio BBS, which just didn't seem like, uh, I mean, I want to play around with this, but I don't want to spend thousands of dollars doing it. And, you know, like I'm saying, like on my next point, most of the, all of these devices each cost hundreds of dollars back in the 80s. And, what? 120? Okay. Well, that's, that's better, but we can do even better than that. Although, um, as a lot of hams over the years have homebrewed their APRS trackers. Um, I've seen a lot of, of installations that are like, you know, a bunch of stuff taped to get like, you know, an old HT going to a coax, going to an antenna outside of the vehicle. And that's not bad. But then they've got like, you know, their TNC and some old GPS and all this stuff that's like gaff taped on the top of their dashboard or whatever. And when you talk to them, they're like, oh yeah, it kind of works. Or sometimes it works. And I'm always tinkering with it, and I'm like, well, that's, that's good. I mean, if you like doing that. Um, but what about reliability? Um, the most reliable are commercial APRS hardware. Um, like, and I'm, we'll, we'll be, so, and really, in the, it's about the last decade that a lot of this has come out. Uh, the first generation, which I believe was the mid 2000s or so, um, the ones I'm aware of were the Kenwood radios. The THD7A, which I think Megalos has one of those. Um, so if you want to see what it looks like, talk to him later. Uh, is, a, is an HT like this one, but it can beacon out packets. It can. It's got a TNC on board, things like that. Um, but then it's also there was also the D700 mobile, which was a 50 watt uh, mobile radio that could do APRS, and it also had the advantage of you could have, I don't know if the D7 was dual band or not, or a dual transmitter. Okay, so they both had dual transmitters. So you could have APRS transmitting on one transmitter and use the other one for your voice communication. Okay, so there, there's, there's even more than I realized with these. Um, the Gen 2s uh, expanded on the feature set um, and those are like the Azu VX8 series of HTs and the Kenwood D72A and then the D7210, D710A mobile. Um, they have, like they, uh, I know the D710A, you can buy software for it that um, you can basically, you know, if you're using repeater book or things like that, you can kind of continuously reprogram it so that you're always using the, the local repeaters as you're driving a long distance, like, you know, across the country or whatever. But, um, like, the new price on D72A is, I just looked it up, it's $459. The D710, once you get the GPS unit um, and a lot of the other accessories that make it nifty, it's like $700. So you're still looking at quite a bit of money if you, if you go this route. Uh, you might find, you know, the older models at ham swaps from guys who want to upgrade. Um, 
but then you're also dealing with, you know, they, if they don't make the batteries anymore, you're, you're using old cells that don't have a long life. So what else is out there? KD8RTT, who's actually from the Cleveland area, he's like a, an engineering student, or he was when he made this video for YouTube, the $30 APRS tracker. Um, and I put it in quotes because maybe it was $30 back then, but um, unfortunately it's not now. The, the, even the Chinese are learning how to charge. But you use a Bofeng UV5R Plus um, HT. Uh, Rashad has one if, you're, if people are wondering what they look like. Uh, that's it right there. And a stereo audio patch cable that you can get at Radio Shack or Best Buy or that sort of thing. 3.5 millimeter uh, stereo audio jack. And an old Android phone. I know you guys, you have these laying around. Everybody does. I have two. Um, you know, so that's basically free. And then there's an app in the App Store called AB APRS Droid, but um, don't download it from the App Store. Well, okay, if you want to, if you want to support the guy, give him five bucks. But you can. He also makes the um, compiled app available as a direct download that you can then sideload. Um, and if you don't know the trick, the easy way to sideload is email it to your Gmail account as an attachment and turn on a uh, third-party app installation in your settings. And then when the email is received by your phone, it will ask you if you want to, if you want to load the app. And it's literally like, you know, less than a second to, to load the app on your phone and then of course turn off the, the um, allow downloadable software through the email on your phone settings. Otherwise, you're probably going to get hacked. Um, you know, because, well, we all know there's malicious people on the internet. Uh, what's this all about, Heartbleed? Um, and you, there's also an iPhone, iPhone variant. I'm not an Apple person. Um, it just is not what I like. And But you can get Pocket Packet and Open APRS from the iTunes store. Uh, and the basic way all of this works is that the, the phone reads its own, reads its position from the GPS and generates the, pack, the APRS packet, AFSK 1200, that's analog frequency shift keying, and then sends it out the audio jack to the mic jack on the radio, which is then Vox's voice operated transmission. So if the radio senses sound on its mic jack, it automatically keys up and transmits it. And um, in theory, what could be simpler? When I was playing with it, you really have to tinker around with the gain settings and the both songs to start to get this to work. Um, however, what's really easy is to use um, APRS Droid direct to the internet um, over the cell network. Now, this has the disadvantage of it's not really disaster proof because um, most of the cell companies are not. I mean, if you have Verizon and the power goes out, your phone might still have connectivity for a day or two because they like to have diesel generators. If you have Sprint like me, it's going to drop right away. And this is the setup. I used it as my interest, my, my uh, first uh, title slide there. So you can see the, the radio with the, um, the audio jack connected to the phone. And then he's using what he was doing because he wanted to see how far he could push this. He connected uh, an external battery, which is the other black box there, aside from the phone and the radio, and then mailed it from his um, parents' house around Cleveland. I think it might have been in Lakewood. I'm not sure. But he, he went to a uh, university in Indiana, so he mailed it to his dorm room in Indiana over spring break to see if, you know, without controlling for orientation of the antenna or where the box was on the UPS truck, like, could he get packets from a $30 radio and a phone that was two years old. What? <laughs> and the answer was he got four packets as it was transmit as it was uh, in transit, and they were all received when the truck passed within about 300 meters of either a digipeter or an eye gate. So it wasn't getting out good signal, and the battery died midway through, like he got packets through, you know, uh, western Ohio and eastern Indiana, but when he, when, he, when he opened up the, when the package was delivered to him and he immediately opened it up, both the battery on the radio and the battery on the phone and his external uh, booster battery there, they were all charged. So it had lost power in, uh, in midway through its uh, transit. The other thing you can do that is um, another cheap way to get on APRS, you'll, you'll probably wind up spending about 80 bucks, well, with, with um, it might be more like 90 with the cable. But the Raspberry Pi, the 700 megahertz microcontrollers that can run Linux, there's a, um, it's a kit, you have to solder it, but it's called a TNC Pi, and you can get them for 40 bucks. 
Um, you'll need an SD card for the Pi too, but uh, again, we've got those lying around, right guys? And, um, you know, it's about $100. And what I'm wanting to do with this, this is kind of my project that I'm working on now, I want to run a database on the Pi and then set this up at like I3D Detroit so we could, you know, uh, we have meetings like the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday of the month and a board meeting on the second Tuesday and, you know, classes. I want to be able to have the APRS Digipeter beacon out um, what's going on right now at the hackerspace to let people, you know, to let ham radio operators know there might be something that they might be interested in attending. Um, you could probably also use the same hardware for WinLink email, but um, WinLink is something else and it's another even more complicated network and I'm going to leave that for right now, but go to winlink.org if you're interested. Um, there's also a $40 USB packet interface. Now, I found this on the net, and then it was from a ham in Australia, and I don't know why. I sent him email, well, I sent him email, and because his page was down. He, he had in, it was up in January, and then February, March or so, he took just this page down, but the basic idea of his project is you take a prolific USB to serial adapter and uh, decase it, and then uh, one of these, I think they're called like OK123 or something like that. They're the little like 10 or $20 USB uh, sound cards that just have audio out and mic in on, the, on one side and the USB port on the other and decase that and a USB 2.0 hub and then solder the, um, solder the prolific and the uh, sound card into two of the ports on the hub and if you make, like, use a laser cutter or something like that to make a custom uh, case for it, you wind up with a nice, neat little box that has a USB-A cable out on one side and then a D9 serial audio in and out and two free USB ports on the other. And so, you know, this will be nice and, and clean. You just plug it into the USB port, plug the audio cables into your radio. If you're running a more complicated uh, radio, kind of like uh, an NB Pierce, you know, F8, Yezu FD897, you can connect some of the computer control ports to the serial port or to the USBs, and um, you can do APRS, and you can do a whole lot more, like PSK31, which is a, a slow-speed Morse code using uh, phase shift keying, and uh, the Winmore protocol, which is what WinLink can use. Um, so, you know, for 40 bucks, this could be a pretty useful thing as a project. Um, there's also a ton of Arduino uh, projects out there, um, but a lot of them are in the XKCD territory of what did you know. Uh, I, would, I would say probably of these, the track Arduino and the Adafruit APRS shield and Argent Data shields would be the ones I would go to because um, Argent Data and Adafruit have a, have a reputation and kind of keep things going. And the track we know is an open source project that has a lot of people who are updating it. Like there was a, uh, just a few days ago, they pushed another version. So, um, but there's a ton of other stuff like Bird OS and X, X, EXP Digi. Um, and all of them are just um, special microcode for the Atmega 328. Um, I've been looking for BeagleBone APRS and there's a lot, there's a few projects out there that are, that are starting to get somewhere, but I think we should check back later in six months or a year. Um, as for open source software, and these are what I mean by this, these are packages for Linux or BSD. Sound modem is the kind of old school way to do this. Um, it doesn't get updated a lot, unfortunately, uh, but it converts your onboard sound card directly into a TNC, so you can plug your, like for example, if you have like a, um, an EPC or any computer that has separate uh, audio and mic in and out, or if you have the Y cable for ones that now have the, like the ThinkPad now come with a um, combined board conductor um, so that you can plug a cell phone remote in there. Um, but you can plug those directly from, basically you, you connect direct from the computer to your radio without a TNC and then sound modem acts as a software TNC. Um, the problem with this is if you're running software that also generates sound, that's also going out those ports. So, um, you know, 
you have an error message in Mac OS or Windows and some cute little sound, well, that just went across the radio. And if it's digital, everything else is not going to know quite how to interpret the Macintosh beep or whatever. Um, Zaster is really the way to go. It's the state-of-the-art APRS software in Linux. Um, and it's available in all of the major software repositories. You can download it, um, configure it, and um, you're also going to have to uh, compile an AX.25 module for your kernel and probably run APRSD um, for both of these. But um, I would say of all of them, Linux or BSD or that sort of thing, if you're, if you're looking to just get your computer or connected to your radio quick and cheap, this is the way to, do, the way to go. Um, as for future directions, and I know there's a, there was a guy actually talking to me on Twitter. He was trying to receive APRS using an RTL SDR, and that was just like last week. But it got me thinking that maybe you could use the little um, $25 RTL SDR. Whoa, sorry about that. Um, you know, let's see here. These are what I'm talking about. Um, this guy here. And you can get these online for about 25 bucks, 30 bucks. And it's a software-defined radio that can receive from, I think it's 50 megahertz to like 1.7 or 2.2 gigahertz, depending on the model. So, um, you know, for 25 bucks, it's a pretty neat uh, little device that'll do that. There's also the forthcoming HackRF. Uh, the Jawbreaker is out now. And these, those are um, a software-defined radio board about the size of a beagle bone. And they connect via USB to your computer. They have um, they, they have the ability to transmit, and I've not seen any kind of um, not seen any kind of uh, specs on what their transmit power is. But I'm guessing the native board would be able to transmit at about two watts, just based on the fact that it's going to power off a USB. Um, but they can transmit and receive from um, I believe 30 or 50 megahertz on the low end, all the way up to six gigahertz. So, uh, and then because of that they're a more, more featureful software-defined radio, it might be possible that you could do frequency hopping spread spectrum mode, kind of like ETLRS. Um, you could maybe set up a, a, a soft digipeter that's like receiving on UHF and on VHF and, and cross-band repeating um, just on this board. And the other thing is, is, you know, since we all have Arduinos and PICs and all like that on our Nauticon badges, um, a good project might be trying to make an APRS tracker out of those. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Uh, yes, in the back. I think we need a, a mic. Today. Thanks. There was another talk about mesh networking today. And uh, when I read about APRS, I often think, is there some way that APRS could be tied into a mesh networking type system that, that may be of more use to the general public? Or is that kind of out of its appropriate area? Oh, uh, so your, your question is, could APRS uh, be tied into it? Well, so um, when you're saying mesh networking, you're thinking more like um, networks that are running on, say, like 2.4 gigahertz or, or up higher in the UHF or in the low microwave there. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? Or just things that use a mesh networking protocol? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about <clears throat> a citizen's private network that would be used whenever needed in cases of, say, civil disturbance of, of whatever type. Well, um, I think I understand where, you, where, so like, you know, things like Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Katrina where, where um, order breaks down for a while. Is that what you're talking about? Or? Or order breaks down or say the, the cable merger uh, decides to turn off Ohio because we're too liberal or something. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's not that, well, first of all, APR, what I like about APRS is that it's like Stone Age you know, it's, it's the stone age of the internet, and it's it's so dead simple that it will work no matter what. There's actually a, a joke one of my friends who's a ham set told me one time that if the apocalypse comes, the only thing that's going to be left are cockroaches and transmit-only APRS trackers. 
Um, but the I think the kinds of you trying to use any kind of amateur radio digital mode for general internet use is problematic in this day and age because of certain FCC regulations that amateurs are required to operate under. We cannot use we cannot obfuscate the content of our messages, which basically means we couldn't use encryption even like SSL. So, and the other thing is, is that we're required to only use our bands for amateur purposes. So, like, I can't order, a, if I could connect, if I connected to a network that connected me to the rest of the internet, I couldn't use my amateur radio station to say order a book from Amazon.com. You know, even even if I could use encryption and felt like I'm sending my credit or felt felt like sending my credit card in the clear because I'm just that crazy, the regulations themselves would say this is a this is a, you know, there's I have a pecuniary interest. I'm buying and selling things, um, and that is expressly forbidden by Part 97 of the FCC code. Thanks. Do you think the APRS uh, techniques could ever be spread to the uh, generally open frequencies? Oh yeah, you could if you wanted. You could um, like in fact we were talking about this last night. There's um, some there's a, another set of bands called the MERS frequencies, multi-use radio service. There are five channels in the uh, um, they're close to the two meter frequencies. They're all like 151 megahertz or 154.600 megahertz, things like that, and those allow you to use voice and data. So. Uh, we were we were uh, some of us hams were sitting around talking like you know maybe you could just retune your radio to those frequencies and if you set up a network there, uh, I I'm not totally sure on this so don't quote me, it may be possible to use encryption there, or the other way to go which would definitely be legal is if you got, um, if you applied to the now this is expensive I the cheapest I've seen when people do this is like three hundred dollars I think I think it's three hundred dollars a year. But if you get your own licensed um, Part 90 commercial radio frequencies from the FCC, then you can run encrypted all you want. Um, and I, it, like when I'm scanning, I will hear traffic that I know is encrypted, or like the the some of the new uh, P25 digital modes are uh, can run crypto by design. And that's and actually amateurs are starting to move into that. They of course have to turn crypto off if they're using it on an amateur frequency, but digital is becoming more and more popular among amateur radio operators. Any other questions? Did I, did, is that? Uh, Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um. So based on that, with the other frequencies, I was wondering about Cipernet. Like, uh, can you actually pick that up on uh, some of your usual amateur radio equipment and just like, ah, it's all encrypted? Or uh... well, I I know what Cipernet is. That's the secure. I don't remember how to like break out the acronym, but it's the uh, U.S. government's secure, um, basically secure internet that runs uh, basically separate from the rest of the internet, like military bases or military missions overseas that can all connect to this. Um, I think that was one of the charges levied against uh, Chelsea Manning that um, was that she was, um, you know, basically taking traffic from off of Cipernet and that was supposed to remain there and basically violating the security protocols. But um, yeah, if if something's transmitted and you know the frequency, you can you can listen to the transmission. Um, if you don't have the encryption key or don't know what modulation technique it, it uses, it will sound uh, like some sort of noise. Uh, if, if it's using analog frequency, in fact, um, just a second here, we'll, uh, there was something else I had pulled up uh, that I'd like to, so like the APRS packets, this is what they sound like, this is from Wikipedia. Um, I was going to try to use my radio, but it kind of interferes with the microphone, but here we go. I don't know if that uh, got through the. So, you know, um, that's just the frequencies varying between two different tones rapidly to indicate ones and zeros. Um, there are other modes that actually vary between, say, four, eight, sixteen tones, and they wind up sounding like, you know, alien electronic music. Like um, a dial-up modem. 
Um, sometimes a little bit. I mean, in fact, some of the, a lot of that old dial-up technology, because uh, a lot of what the modems are doing is they're negotiating between themselves what, what speeds they both can run at. And so, yeah, a lot of these, if you're, if you're running a, kind of an open network where nobody knows, like, you know, I have a radio that can, can under, uh, my TNC understands 9600 baud and yours only does 300, then you'll hear those similar auto negotiation tones as old modems. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, is there any uh, use of uh, DTMF in? Uh, obviously, it doesn't sound like yeah. from that from that tone. But is there any um, uh, reason that people would would use both for like the same sort of purpose? Um, I don't think that there's any. I don't think any people use DTMF for APRS. Mm -hmm. But amateurs do use DTMF tones for a couple of other uh, digital connection networks. One's called IRLP, Internet Repeater Linking Protocol, and the other is called Echolink. Uh, and there, that's that's why all of that's why you'll see basically the telltale that it's an amateur radio is that it has a keypad, um, mm -hmm. because I'm you know I'm a licensed operator, therefore I'm assumed to know what I'm doing. Uh, I don't know mm -hmm. if that's true or not. Mm -hmm. But um, like, if you look at a police radio or a commercial radio, it doesn't really have a keypad. It might have like a channel up, channel down, but the assumption there is that the person using it doesn't understand radio. They just know that they have to be on channel three. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I could key this up on a repeater that has that has this you know internet linking ability. Type in the code, the four digit or five digit code for another repeater and then be connected to it remotely. Um, I actually used this about 18 months ago because some friends of mine uh, went out to Burning Man and there's a re repeater there. And then and, uh, and there was all this spotty communication coming back that like on the way there things were going very badly for them so people didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I was able to contact my friend by linking a local repeater in Detroit with the repeater in Gerlach and we were passing messages back and forth, you know, mostly of the, of the, of the kind of, you know, don't worry, mom. I'm okay. We're not dead yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, stuff like that. But um, I, amu I, I amused a lot of hams because we were we were using old school national traffic service radiograms over 440. Um, and one of them said, "Now I've heard it all on this repeater, including you know, auto patch the phones and and now this." But um, that's what DTMF tones are usually used for in amateur radio. Cool. I was wondering about your general thoughts on Hack RF. I'm really looking forward to it. Unfortunately, I didn't get in on the Kickstarter, but um, I have a lot of ideas for a, a software-defined radio that's that uh, inexpensive because the USRPs are just way beyond my budget. Um, I mean, the, the first thing that, that comes to my mind is I would like something HT size that can operate on any and all of the amateur bands that are VHF and UHF. Like if I could have a radio that actually could do single side band on six meters and you know all the modes on two meters, 440, 220 megahertz, 900 megahertz, um, I would really like something like that. Especially if it could run an operating system to where I don't need, to, I'm not limited to 200 program memories or a thousand program memories. I just can have the entire database and say my GPS location is here, figure out what repeaters are near me, then start scanning them. That would be like my first project with a hack RF. I think we're out of time. But if you guys see me around or I can move out to the uh, main area there, you know, feel free to come up and ask questions.